Hi friends, I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Well, today's video is probably going to feel more like a podcast than a video. Today I wanna to go through almost all the cut flowers that I've ever grown before and just share what my personal experience has been growing them in a hot, humid climate that generally gets a lot of rain. This year is definitely the exception, but normally we get a lot of rainfall. Also, I'm growing on property that was previously a vegetable farm at for decades. So a lot of pests were already present on this property when I moved in. Also, the flowers that I grow and sell are all sold at a roadside stand. So all of my flowers need to be really tough and they need to be able to handle the heat of a flower stand. Now, all of these things I did not take into consideration eight years ago when I first started growing and selling cut flowers. Instead, what I did, now I had been a gardener previous to selling cut flowers, and when we moved here is when I really kind of dived deep into growing cut flowers and selling them. The second year that we lived here, Florette came out with her book, cut flower garden and that book really inspired me to just go for it but as I read this book and as I was trying to decide what to grow that second year which is the first year that I really did it more seriously and went for that mark of paying our property taxes with the profit that I made from the cut flowers I basically looked at Erin's book marked down everything that she said was easy grew that didn't do any succession planting. And even though I met my mark of $5,000 profit, I consider that a major learning year. I don't wanna say it was a failure, but I will tell you that I only grow one of those flowers currently. Of all the flowers that I grew that first year, I have eliminated them all from my cut flower garden. And it's really because climate plays such a big um, or should I say climate is such a big deciding factor in I think what we all should be growing. Sorry, I'm gonna put my sunglasses on. It's just too sunny. So all that to say, the flowers that I chose to grow that were listed as easy actually turned out to be hard or not beneficial based on my climate, my pests, and how I was going about selling the flowers. So my hope for this video is that if you have a similar climate, if you are selling at a roadside stand, and if you also prefer not to spray anything in your garden, that something that I might say in this video would be helpful. So I guess with all that being said, now let's start talking about some cut flowers. Lots of cut flowers, that is. And I pulled out two books. I don't have any notes for this video. I'm just gonna speak from the heart and memory about all of these flowers. But I'm going to reference Cut Flower Garden, Cool Flowers, and also A Year in Flowers, just to kind of help keep me on track. And we'll just take a look at the flower that these wonderful authors are mentioning. And I'll share about what my personal experience has been growing them in a hot, humid, and wet climate with heavy pest pressure and whether or not I feel like that flower is worth growing on a small scale and if it can hold up to the heat of a flower stand. So let's dive into what's probably going to be a super long video. I already see something I do very differently now eight years in than I did at the beginning and in this book it talks about spacing cut flowers densely, spacing them at about nine by nine inches. I would say for a lot of flowers, I'm pu pushing them even closer together at this point. I'm doing a lot of things at four by four inches and even, this might sound crazy, but two by two inches. The saponaria, the bupleurum, the orlea, the bachelor's buttons, the nigella, and the snapdragons are all no further apart than four inches. Some are even as close, like the sapin area is at two inches. And I'm not sure why that works for me. I don't really want to put bad information out there in this video, but all I can say is, is that it does work for me. 
Now, I know some people deal with rust on Snapdragons. That's not something I've ever experienced here. So please, if you've experienced rust on your Snapdragons, let us know what your preferred spacing is. But I was very happy with the 4x4 spacing last year. I repeated it this year. I also did not pinch the Snapdragons this year, and I'm much happier with their performance. The Savin area is in at 2x2 two two inches. The Orlea, the Buplorum, the Bachelor's Buttons, the Nigella are all insanely close together. So are my bread seed poppies. I would say I can see them from here. I would say they're at about two inches. So anything that I have that blooms in the very early spring before powdery mildew is really a very serious issue, I'm pushing the spacing even tighter than what I see recommended in a lot of books. Now, things like dahlias, zinnias, and we'll talk a lot about my thoughts on zinnias here, but I would still maintain that wider spacing with things that are growing later in the year, are prone to powdery mildew, have a long days to maturity. I still want to give them all that space in between the plants, all that great airflow. But in terms of cool flowers, I guess you could say I'm really pushing the spacing even tighter because why not? If it works, it works. And a lot of these things I didn't even have to corral this year. I'm looking across the way at a bed of fever few. I can overlay that for you. Once again, those plants are so, so close together and they are so tall and looking so fabulous. So just something to take into consideration. Maybe think about spacing your cool flowers even tighter than what's normally recommended. And like I say, take everything that I say in this video with a grain of salt. This is just what is working for me currently eight years in. And after another eight years, my thoughts on all this could be drastically different. But here's where we are at so far. So why don't we just start out with hardy annuals. Which hardy annuals can really hold up at a flower stand? Which ones are pest and disease resistant? And which ones really kind of melt down in the heat of the flower stand? So there are just a few noted here in Cut Flower Garden. So I'll go ahead and talk a, a lot about a lot more than what's shown here. But the ones that I've grown from this page are Love in a Mist, Bells of Ireland, Larkspur, and Honeywurts, um, also called Cerinth, Cerinth Major. So I've grown all of these and the ones that I feel like are worth growing at a flower stand where it's going to be hot at the time that you're selling them are all of them with the exception of the syrinth or the honeywort. I have to get used to saying honeywort. I don't think I've ever called it that. The thing with syrinth major is that it's absolutely beautiful. It has that beautiful blue foliage, kind of a blue purple dangling flower, and you can use quick dip on it. You can burn the ends and you can stick the ends into boiling water and that will help keep the stems nice and turgid. However, even if you do that, and like I said, everything I say here is just from my personal experience, but when I've done that and stuck it out at the flower stand at 85 degrees, it still melts down. So I'm not growing Cerinth Major anymore. I just don't feel like it's really worth it. It's a beautiful color. I love that it has that nice succulent texture. It's very easy to grow, easy to plant. However, I feel like a better substitute or a replacement for Cerinth Major is Baptisia. It is a perennial. It comes back fresh every year. It has that wonderful, similar foliage color However, it doesn't melt down in the heat. And really, you can use it in place not only of Cerinth Major, but also in the place of Eucalyptus. So that's one where, as I take a look at all these pictures and I say, which did I used to grow or which have I grown and which ones wouldn't I grow anymore? Because of the heat of the flower stand, I would say Cerinth Major. Now let's talk about some similar umble flowers such as Ami Magus and Orlea. 
I have grown Ami Magus in the past. I'm not going to grow it probably ever again. For me, it doesn't bloom enough before the heat takes it out. So times that I've grown it, I thought it was lovely, but as soon as it gets hot, it just kind of fizzles out. The plant turns yellow, brown, dies, and you have to pull it out probably in, I would say, mid-July here. And it never gives you a nice textural seed pod like Orlea does. And I just talked about that in the last video. I grow a lot of Orlea, not for the white flower, but for the green textural seed pod that is as tough as nails, that doesn't need conditioned at all, that it leaves behind. As a matter of fact, you can cut Aurelia green as a seed pod, leave it lying in the garden overnight, come back in the morning, pick it up, and it will look like you just cut it. So there's a situation where if I had taken the advice of once again, people that I admire, and cut Aurelia at, I think people are saying cut it at like three fourths open or almost open in the white stage. If I still did that, conditioned it properly and set it out the flower stand and it was 95 degrees that day, no one is gonna wanna buy those flowers because they're gonna look absolutely terrible, be completely wilted over, wimpy looking, sad, and looks like I don't know what I'm doing, frankly. That's the other thing. I think when you have flowers out at a flower stand that are melting down, you might be doing everything right. You might be like pouring your heart and soul into conditioning these flowers correctly. But if that flower just can't handle being out there at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, it just can't handle it. So that's a situation to think about you know, are you growing something that maybe just needs to be cut at a different stage if you're selling roadside? So before we move further on into the Cut Flower Garden book, I'm going to go through all the cool flowers really quickly and just say which ones have any kind of pests or disease issues for me and which ones melt down at the flower stand or which ones just aren't valuable enough to grow anymore. So the corn cockle, I grew corn cockle. I didn't personally like the way it looked. I thought it looked much too much like a wildflower. And you might've had this experience before someone comes to your stand and they say, oh, what beautiful wildflowers you have. That is not what I want to hear <laughs> about my flower stand. I wanna put out there the most beautiful flowers people have ever seen. I want them to be surprised that I have high-end flowers out there. And so that's one reason why I have eliminated corn cockle from the list of things that I grow. Once again, please, I know that kind of sounds bad, but you know, if you have a small space and you have to make a decision between corn cockle and snapdragons or corn cockle and bells of Ireland, you know, choose bells of Ireland, choose snapdragons if you are limited on space. That's what I'm trying to say here. We already talked about Queen Anne's lace. Um, dill, I've had a lot of issues with dill melting down at the flower stand. I also, feels like, I also feel like it blooms too late in the season to provide um, the value needed for the space. So I don't really bother to grow dill anymore. Then of course we come to snapdragons. I feel like snapdragons are probably the most valuable cool flower that there is. They're beautiful, they come in a wide range of colors, relatively easy to grow. I'm currently growing them four inches apart. I'm netting them, I'm not pinching them. Very happy with the results. Lots of information on the Johnny's website and I've done a video also on it about the different groups and so you can figure out which group is best for which time of the year, but I feel like, you know, you just gotta grow a snapdragon. Now, in contrast to that, in my area, I do not grow stock anymore. The reason being is that there was some kind of a pest, and it was just too early on for me to be able to remember what pest it was, but basically I lost my entire first crop of stock. I also grew a variety that was way too short the first year, so that was a big fail. Second year I grew it, I got that same pest. I'm sorry, I can't remember what it was. It was something like a flea beetle, but I just can't remember what it was. I also didn't know that stock makes water smell terrible. It makes it smell like 
like old cabbage. And it also blooms at a time where I didn't need a spike flower. I was able to sell straight bunches of tulips. I was able to sell straight bunches of peonies and ranunculus. And I really didn't need to bother with a flower that even though the fragrance of the flower was beautiful, that was bringing all these pests into my garden very early on in the season, that's a big problem. And also was making the water smell bad for my customers. So no more stock. I'd rather just double up on the snapdragons. We talked about Bupleurum. I think that's completely worth growing. It's so easy to grow. It does last well at the flower stand as long as you let it sit overnight to condition. After you cut Bupleurum and you wait to cut Bupleurum until it's basically in full flower, cut it, let it condition in that bucket of water overnight, then it will be fine. Now, if you cut it, sometimes it will melt down a little bit there initially, but it will rebound and it will be fine in the heat of a flower stand. Up until I would say about 85 degrees, that's where I consider not cutting it and cutting something else that day. Something like Solomon seal, something like Macrophylla hydrangea foliage. Those two plants in late spring are a very tough foliage that can take the heat of a flower stand even if you get up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Next up we have calendula or some people call it pot marigold. I grew that over at Plain and Fancy Farm. I liked it as ornamental, so I brought it over here, started to grow a cut flower version of calendula here. And at the time I had no idea that the stems were really, really sticky to work with. And also I did not feel that calendula had a very good vase life. So I don't grow calendula anymore. Canterbury Bells. I'm still failing. I'm still failing with the Canterbury Bells. Why can't I grow them? I don't know. I have terrible germination on Canterbury Bells. I have a terrible time getting them to overwinter, whatever ones do germinate. So let me know your tips and tricks on getting Canterbury Bells to grow properly. Bachelor's buttons. You know, I love bachelor's buttons. And maybe it's not fair that I don't really feel like it's worth growing corn cockle, but I feel like it's worth growing bachelor's buttons. And I think the difference is the color because corn cockle, I'm pretty sure it comes in white. I grew the pink one, but bachelor's buttons, you can get that true blue. You can get that beautiful deep maroon. And those colors work really well in late spring because we have Memorial Day, we have Mother's Day, and I just feel like it's more about the colors than it is about the wildflower look because my husband likes to call bachelor's buttons the weed flower. <laughs> And, and he is right, you know, the plant itself is not super attractive, but to be able to come out here and to take a bouquet that is just not full enough to cut 10 stems of blue or maroon bachelor's buttons, tuck them in and then have it look finished and, looks like, and look like it's worth the amount of money that I'm asking, I really feel like it's super valuable. Also, all you have to do is just direct sew bachelor's buttons here in the fall, make sure it germinates, and then never touch it again. Never cover, I've never covered it. I've never even watered it again. So for me, the easy care nature to a bachelor's buttons makes it worth it. Next up, we have delphinium and larkspur. And I've talked in the past about how I really only, I do have some delphinium in the driveway garden just for fun and ornamental value but the cost and the time associated with growing delphinium from seed, because you have to start it earlier inside, plant it out, hope that it doesn't rain too much because it does not like sitting in a wet, cold soil, which is what sometimes happens here in March when you would wanna be planting it out here. So instead, I just feel like it's easier and just as valuable to direct sow larkspur in the fall. And once again there, I'm choosing the larkspur over the delphinium because I can direct seed it. It's easier to grow. It doesn't require any time under my lighting system. It's reliable. It's a great cut flower. It doesn't succumb to disease like delphinium. 
and it will reseed itself if you let it. Now I'm cutting on all these plants so hard that most of the time they're not able to reseed themselves. But if you had a cutting garden that you were just using for personal use, certainly Larkspur would just continue to reseed itself. And so that's why I feel like if you're in a situation like me, Larkspur is so much more valuable and just easier care than Delphinium. Now next up we have Sweet William. I love Sweet William. I'm gonna grow so much more of it from here on out because I am testing a couple of different kinds of Sweet William. The Sweet series, which is the purple white bicolor, which I have in the raised bed. I also have the Sweet, I think it's just pink or hot pink in the driveway garden. They are lasting in the vase for two whole weeks and they don't seem to mind the heat of the flower stand at all. I can even cut them in the heat of the day if necessary. Not that that's the best thing to do, but sometimes it happens. Sometimes somebody contacts you at 1 p.m. and says, can I pick up a bouquet in an hour and you don't have anything? So I feel like Sweet William is a super valuable plant to grow. And you know, the longer that I do this, I just wanna grow more of what works really, really well and what sells really well and what holds up really well versus trying to grow everything. So also you can start Sweet William in my area inside in the fall, plant it out in the fall. It was able to overwinter here uncovered and I had it blooming in mid-May to cut. So just a super valuable cut flower. So the next three are Foxglove, Lysianthus, and Godaisha, or I just call it Clarkia. I'm not sure which is the common name and which is the botanical there. Foxglove, I feel like is worth growing for myself. That's something that I kind of selfishly grow because I like to practice floral design. Um, but in terms of how does it hold up at the flower stand, it actually holds up okay. Um, I do have some issues with rust on the foxglove. It does not seem to be such a huge problem like it is on hollyhocks, but it is something to be aware of. I'm not going to dedicate a whole raised bed to foxglove, but I like tucking it into the landscape more for personal use, but I do have issues with rust on it for sure. Lysianthus, I have grown some years, not grown others. For me, and where I want to go moving forward, and, and in the last two years especially, is really more towards uh, perennial bulbs. And that's just because I don't have to be running as many trays of things under lights. I can just get these bulbs in the ground and cut them and they're more valuable. So instead of growing something like a lysianthus, I would rather grow a ranunculus. I would rather grow an anemone. I would rather grow a lily. Give me a lily any day pretty much over anything because I just don't think you can beat lilies. Everyone buys lilies like crazy and all you do is stick the bulb in the ground, water it, walk away and cut it and then it's just done. You know, you just can't beat that. And it's funny, in a lot of books, no one is talking about these flowers that are so easy and problem free and have such a high value at a roadside stand. So. I can't say enough good things about lilies. I just ordered another succession yesterday. Straw flower, sweet peas, bells of Ireland. You guys know I love straw flower and we might as well touch on zinnias while we're right here. This year, I'm growing more straw flower successions to replace almost all of my zinnia successions. Zinnias were the first flower I grew, and I grew so many of them that first year, way too many. They all bloomed at once. They were all over this property in rows. Well, I got one good cut off of all of them. Then of course they all got powdery mildew. At that point, I did not realize that I had to succession plant them every month here in our area. So in the following years, I started to just succession plant the zinnias once a month but only having an acre and having something that is not perceived by the public here in my area as a valuable flower 
it's not worth it. I don't think for me personally in my situation to grow zinnias at all anymore. And I think that's something else to take into consideration. And I think I mentioned this once before, but what are the people around you selling? And what I would rather do is set myself apart from that. So I am in an Amish community, tons of people sell flowers all around me. In fact, if you took a five minute walk, you could buy flowers that were priced at a fourth of what I'm charging. So what do I do about that? I grow higher end flowers. So I'm not growing, what was that? <laughs> we got a bird back there. I'm not growing azuratum. I'm not growing zinnias anymore. I'm not growing cosmos. No more marigolds, only higher end celosias. So that way my flowers are different. They appear different. They're wrapped. They, um, they can pay via Venmo, which of course, you know, being Amish, the Amish only take cash. The Amish are not open on Sunday, so I'm always open on Sunday. So it's not about competition at all. It's just about how do I wanna be different from the people selling around me so that I can still maintain that higher price point. Sweet peas, I just grow for fun. I don't sell them. Bells of Ireland, I think it's just a wonderful flower. It has a great fragrance. It's pretty easy to grow. It sometimes gives me issues with germination, but as long as I can get it to germinate in the fall, I usually have really, really good success with it. My best advice on getting Bells of Ireland to germinate is to just make sure and keep that bed really, really moist. It takes a long time for Bells of Ireland to germinate. You know, when you look at the seed, it looks like an arrow. It has a really thick seed coat on it. I've never tried soaking it. Maybe that would be a good idea. I'm not sure. But as long as I can keep that bed moist until they germinate, then I'm okay. But sometimes I, you know, have to be on watering that bed even three times a day so the seed doesn't dry out. And I think it's really valuable. It holds up really well at the stand. Um, great in terms of how big it is in a bouquet. It takes up a lot of room. It dries nicely and not a lot of people around here grow it. So another great reason to grow Bells of Ireland for my particular situation. Next up we have Lombada, which from a personal standpoint I absolutely love. I think it's such a beautiful flower. I love to arrange with it. I'm not growing it this year because I'm really trying to get back into only selling at the flower stand. I did do some florist sales last year and a lot more specialty orders last year, but with a new flower stand and just with my age and health at what it is, I need easy things that produce well and are reliable. So this year I'm not growing Lombata just because it does require special conditioning. I find Quick Dip works best for Lombata, but I just chose not to grow it this year. I'm trying not to grow anything that requires quick dip this year. Love and a Mist, you know, I love growing Love and a Mist. Not only is it a beautiful true blue flower, but also it has that great seed pod. So if you miss it in flower, you can grab the seed pod, add that into an arrangement, holds up great in the heat of a flower stand, the seed pod that is. We already talked about Orlea grandiflora, Iceland poppy. Um, I think I only grew Iceland poppy for two years. I quickly abandoned growing that and instead I grow the bread seed poppies for the seed pods to add into bouquets. I feel like probably with Iceland poppies if you had a hoop house that might be worth growing but once again you know when an Iceland poppy is blooming I can also have late tulips blooming so I would rather have that one day planting all those late tulips and then not worry about them at all and be able to sell them versus taking all the time required to grow Iceland poppies in my area. Black Eyed Susan is one that's hard and the reason why I don't sell, <laughs> Rocky's being so funny right now behind you. The reason why I don't really put Black Eyed Susan in the bouquets anymore is just once again, because my neighbors put a lot of Black Eyed Susan into their bouquets and I'm just really trying for that more high-end look to the bouquets the older I get and the longer that I do this. I also feel like Rubeckia petals don't take the heat well which is kind of shocking because you think well like our native Rubeckia blooms in August and it should be able to take the heat 
but for whatever reason it really does tend to melt down at the flower stand and I'll have to double check this but if my memory serves me right I'm pretty sure that it was also mucking up the water so I also have tried to eliminate flowers that muck up the water because I don't want my customer to have to know that oh some of the flowers in here are gonna you know make the water smell or make the um, water need changed continuously or I need to put some kind of bleach into the water. I just want to be producing flowers that are easy for myself and also easy for my customer. Feverview, I feel like I just love Feverview. You can't have enough of it. The only thing different that I do with Feverview now versus at the very beginning is that I cut it a little bit later for the flower stand. I think in most books you'll see to cut it I'm not sure if people are saying cut it maybe like three fourths open, but I wait until it's actually fully open for sales at a hot flower stand and it does much better like that. If you cut Fever Few, in my experience, and it's only a half open, so you have some of the flowers on the spray not open, all of those are going to just, you know, as they sit there in the heat. And so they'll end up cutting them off anyway as the day goes on, trying to eliminate them so that the bouquets don't look bad. So at this point, I just wait until the whole spray is bloomed and even have to sacrifice some of those initial blooms. I would rather sacrifice old blooms at the top and have the entire spray open versus have the top ready and the sides not ready. Once again, that's probably totally different if you're selling to a florist, if you're selling to a grocery store, but selling at a flower stand, I feel like that makes a really, really, really big difference. It will melt down and it will not recover if it is cut too soon and then put into the heat. So now we're going to switch back to cut flower garden and I want to focus on flowers that I did not grow initially that are really what I depend on now, which is perennial, bulbs, corms, tubers, roots. These are the flowers that I feel like not only are just easier for me to grow, but they sell so well. No one else is selling them around me and they're just so beautiful. They are more high-end flowers and I was scared of growing some of these flowers early because I heard they were hard to grow. I heard you couldn't grow them without a hoop house like ranunculus. But my experience is, is that you just kind of have to mess with it a little bit and find out what's right for you. And you can grow things like ranunculus without a hoop house. And they sell so well, especially if there's 20 flower stands around you and you're the only one that has ranunculus, of course you're gonna sell the ranunculus. But if you're selling what everyone else is selling and you're selling at a much higher price point, it's probably gonna be hard for you to sell those flowers. So that's really why, once again, I wanna be selling higher end flowers. I'm asking for a higher price than my neighbors. I need to be offering something different, something that's more valuable. So I made a big investment in peonies about four or five years ago, I guess. I'm just now starting to see the benefits of that. Ranunculus, when I took the class with um, Dave Dowling, Advanced Flower Farming School, which was an awesome class, I'm pretty sure he talked about, or he had discouraged people from growing ranunculus without a hoop house. Now, at that point when I took his class, I just took his class recently to see what it was like. I really liked it. Um, but you definitely can grow ranunculus without a hoop house. I've been doing it for five years. I told you guys the other day my main problem is the black bean aphids and the powdery mildew. It's hard for me to control the powdery mildew. I can't really control the rain situation without a hoop house. But, you know, I'm looking more into these trap crops after seeing the black bean aphids, now discovering my bread seed poppies and leaving my ranunculus alone. So I think it can be done. You just might need to figure out what works best for you to get them growing in your zone. But I think it's completely worth the investment. Also, you can save the corms. This is a one-time investment. So um, also a lot of people will say in books that they buy new corms every year. I don't. I save the corms. If the corms haven't got very, very sick, I save every single corm. Just let the plant die back. It'll happen when it gets hot. You'll see it. It'll go yellow, brown, 
dig them up, stick them in your basement, and I just put them in daffodil bags, and that's all there is to it. Sweet peas, aren't they beautiful? I don't personally sell them, just too hot here, but they are beautiful. Now we're on to tulips, and you know this year I did miss the ball on tulips. You guys know I had surgery. Sorry, I don't keep, I don't, I'm not trying to keep bringing that up, but I think it's important to note that the reason why I kind of skipped that is because I was not able to sell during that uh, period of time. But I feel like tulips are incredibly valuable. Not only do they give you a great return on your investment, but they also announce your opening to people before the peonies, which I didn't have this year for the first time ever. So I was having to announce my opening with a more expensive flower. I was having to announce my opening with peonies, but I would much prefer, and you know, prayers to God that I'll be healthy next spring, but I was not able to announce my opening with tulips this year. And I feel like that was really problematic because throwing tulips on the compost pile doesn't feel so bad. Throwing peonies on the compost pile feels pretty, pretty bad. So lots of great resources on the best tools for cut flower production. I will put as many PDFs in the description section of this video that I can on bulb production because as I say that's what I do for work full-time so most of what I focus on are bulbs and so I will share all the PDFs with you that I have in regards to cut flowers grown from bulbs. So now we're moving on to summer annuals grown from seed and I hope that you've stuck around for this part of the video because this is where I have made the biggest change. I am growing a very, very limited selection of summer annuals. The reason being, once again, I would rather grow a non-stop supply of lilies, gladiolas, and then at the end dahlias and just grow filler and sunflowers versus attempting to create an entire bouquet all summer from annuals grown from seed, which is what I did early on, which is what I see often recommended. The recommendation is often that it's easier, it's um, less money up front. I mean, I feel, I feel scared saying this, but I actually would disagree with that because your labor is valuable, labor is time, and it's a lot more laborious to grow a lot of things under lights from seed than it is to just stick a bulb in the ground and then have it for years and years and years. So that's just my two cents on that. Take that with a grain of salt. But the plants that I am growing under lights have to be highly, highly valuable. So Cosmos, I think it's been at least five or six years since I've grown Cosmos, probably five years. Um, they don't last that long in a vase. They don't really do well at the heat of the flower stand. And once again, they kind of have that wildflower look. That is the perception that I get from people. That is what they tell me. So I don't grow them anymore. They are beautiful though, aren't they? Okay, dahlias. <laughs> so we skipped ahead to dahlias. Hopefully we get back into seeds in a second. So we have powdery mildew here in our area. We have tarnished plant bug. That's another reason why I don't like to grow zinnias so much. We have tons of earwigs. Earwig earwigs are a good bug, but I have a really, really big abundance of earwigs. Um, I have four lime plant bug, I have cucumber beetle. I have so many bugs that like dahlias that it is still a struggle for me to grow really healthy dahlia plants. Um, I don't spray anything at all. That includes organic sprays. I don't use organic sprays. If I have a bug issue out here, it's either I'm going to pick it off by hand or I'm going to attempt to bring in a beneficial insect to take care of the problem for me. So I guess what I would say about dahlias is, is I still have a lot to learn. I really still have a lot to learn about dahlias because I do have one girlfriend in the area that grows an amazing field of dahlias. Um, she's not organic. so. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, I was even at Longwood Gardens last year and the dahlias there respectfully looked really, really bad. Mine looked just as bad. You know, it's just kind of hard 
when they're being hit from all different angles. One thing that I just heard on a podcast the other day, a fabulous podcast, it was, I'll try to link it if I can, I think it was the Flower Podcast. It was Daniel from Petal Pickers, who, by the way, even being in Pennsylvania, Daniel for me is a fabulous resource because once again, he's got that high humidity going on. And he just mentioned on the podcast that he succession plants his dahlias and he does another planting in July. And he said those were like the healthiest dahlias that he's ever grown. So I'm gonna try that this year, um, but definitely check Daniel out at Petal Pickers. So I still have a lot to learn about dahlias. Eight years in, I still don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> the best luck is I've the best luck I've had with dahlias is growing them from seed. Those ones are always so much healthier than the big showy ones. So I really want to touch on this fragrant leaves section, especially once again, selling at a roadside stand. Most of these are not going to work well in the heat. So especially basil, basil even conditioned properly set out at a flower stand that's 95 degrees Fahrenheit will definitely melt to pieces. Um, I've heard some people say they like to use mint, apple mint. I've tried that, it works okay. But once again, I would rather fall back on at that point in the year, right? If we're growing basil, that means it's about like July or August. Now the foliage that I want for the flower stand at that point is forsythia, 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 and forsythia, and nine bark. <laughs> and I'm not, that's all I want. That's all I want because it can take it. It can take the heat at that time in the year. By that point, forsythia is nice and dark. It's leathery feeling. Um, don't use the fresh tip growth on forsythia. That will melt down but forsythia will root in the vase even. It will last, I would be willing to say, two weeks in the vase. Um, at that point, sometimes the, the Solomon seal is usually all gone by that point. I've usually cut it all, but you can't be forsythia. Nine bark works well also, but if I had to choose one valuable foliage plant, forsythia, layer it, just push the branch down, put some soil on top of it, stick a rock on it, it will root itself, it will come up, and then you can just cut it from the parent plant, transplant it all over your garden. Of course, only propagate plants that don't have a patent. But this is the way that I now went from one forsythia plant in our very front yard by the flower stand to forsythia lining this entire fence and all the way in the back there, only by layering. Um, if you take nothing else from this video, if you're struggling with foliage, if you're writing in groups, you know, what kind of foliage can I grow for a July and August? Don't even think about planting anything from seed. If you're selling at a flower stand, just get some forsythia in the ground. And I'm sure someone around you will be willing to give you some for free. Once again, as always, only propagate plants that don't have a patent. Now we arrive at the queen for me here in Southern PA, the lily. You can grow lilies from mid-June until basically the frost. You just order them from your supplier. It depends on what supplier you buy from. Some suppliers, you can schedule it out so that you're getting the bulbs every so often, and then you can plant the bulbs every so often. Some suppliers, you'll have to make an order on one date and then you'll have to make an order on another date to get another shipment. So it's just something to look into, but you don't have to plant your lily bulbs all at once. You can get them sent to you. You can get succession sent to you. You can also plant all the different kinds. So we've got Mardigan lilies. I don't think I would go about selling these anymore. They're too valuable, but soon we'll have the Asiatic. Then we'll have the Orientals. Then we'll have the L, well, actually we'll have the LA in between that, then the Oriental, then kind of the Longiflorum Oriental. But you see, you can stagger them that way. You can also stagger the bulb planting and you can really have lilies all the time. You can plant them in the garden. You can plant them in a raised bed. You can plant them in crates. I really feel like lilies are the most valuable cut flower I just can't say enough good things about lilies. If I ever write a book, a lily's gonna be on the cover and an amaryllis. 
So it looks like now we're getting into some perennials. I've already touched on my thoughts on delphinium. She's gonna talk a little bit about phlox, which in my experience, phlox um, is really prone to powdery mildew. So I have just very limited um, amount of phlox here in the garden. Yarrow, I feel like it's definitely worth growing. So many wonderful varieties of yarrow. Um, drought tolerant, that seems to be a big problem this year. So the yarrow is doing great despite the drought. Holds up well at the flower stand. I wait until it is pretty much all fully open for the flower stand. Yarrow is one of those where if you cut it too early, it will flop and you can't recover it. Some flowers will flop and they will recover after conditioning. Um, take for instance, Dara. If Dara flops and then you stick it in boiling water, you can revive it as long as you didn't cut it way, way too soon. But in my experience, if you try to revive, revive yarrow, it just doesn't work. Okay, roses. So here in Pennsylvania, we have all kinds of issues with roses. We've got black spot, we've got all kinds of pests. And then of course we have Japanese beetles. I did have roses going on in the garden to start at this point. I have two roses. I have one in the front yard, one along the garage. I will probably get rid of both of them this year. I feel like they bring in more problems. They create more problems than they give. It's very sad for me to say that, but once again, it's one of those things where I don't want to have, I don't want to introduce things that I know are going to be a problem into my garden. I would rather grow more peonies, which don't have any problem here. Similar look, somewhat similar bloom time, a little bit earlier, and not grow any roses. Just say, okay, this is where I live. This is what works best for me. I'm gonna grow a lot more lilies and I'm not gonna worry that I can't grow roses well here. We've got the Gumfrina, the Celosia. We've got Marigolds and we've got Dara here. So for me, gomfrina is just something that I have to grow. You know, when I think of my grandma, I think of gomfrina. <laughs> we did so many crafts with gomfrina growing up. Um, you know, my grandma had one acre and she didn't sell cup flowers. She was a floral judge, but she was also, um, she was a master gardener, but she was also head of the, oh goodness is the Pennsylvania Garden Club Federation. She was the president. So anyway, all that to say, we did a lot of volunteer work with cut flowers. That's kind of what I grew up doing. She was my main babysitter. And so a lot of times we would be going to the schools, the nursing homes, sometimes to different hotels where she was doing programs at. We would be cutting flowers from her garden and then using them in all these different applications, whether we did floral design, whether we did dried florals, we did a lot of dried florals, and then we did a lot of vermicomposting. That was the other thing that she was really passionate about. She loved vermicomposting, so we did a lot of that. All that to say, I will always go grow gomfrina because of her. As long as I don't cut it too early in the season, as long as I'm patient with it and wait until it's ready for harvest, it is good to go in the heat. Sometimes little side shoots, will wilt at the flower stand. So I'll just cut those off if that happens. Marigolds. Last year I attempted to sell marigolds. I'm not sure if I told you how that flower stand went. It was a couple times I tried to sell them and it was really, really bad. Friends, it was so bad. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be growing and trying to sell marigolds again. Around here, I just they just didn't sell. Yeah, it was a complete waste of that whole bed for me. Celosias. I am growing a specialty celosia this year that is a light peach and I'm specifically growing that because I'm growing a lot of light peach to mid-range peach gladiolus. So I am growing a celosia because of that. Celosia sells great at the flower stand. It holds up great. You can kind of cut it when it's the size that you want, but before it started to push the seeds out of the bloom, that's when I like to cut it. And that's when it does the best for me at the flower stand. I thought we already talked about Dara. Hopefully I didn't get that wrong. Okay, then she's going into some vegetables. So now we're going into zinnias. So I think I pretty much touched on this earlier. 
but this year I was not going to grow any zinnias was my initial thought. I decided to grow just one wave of zinnias um, for late August. They're currently under lights. They are the queen lime with orange. Um, I need to grow those for an event, but if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be growing any zinnias at all, just because I would rather grow straw flowers. Straw flower is, I think, similar enough to replace a zinnia. It doesn't have any problems for me disease-wise. It blooms sooner for me. It doesn't require, um, it's, not, it's not getting any irrigation. Even in the drought, it was completely fine and it's a great dried flower. People are looking for those type of things now too. Now when I'm advertising, I'm trying to say how long everything lasts. I'm trying to say if it's a good dried flower or not. I even advertised the ranunculus and the peonies. Oh my goodness, I have to show you these dried peonies I did. They're just drying so beautifully. So anything else I can do, hi Grace, to encourage sales and kind of say, here's another reason why to buy these flowers versus the Rubecchia and the Zinnias and things like that and the Cosmos that might be cheaper than me. But here's a reason why to buy these flowers instead. Grace, what are you doing? So now let's take a look at greens and pods. I think I've only grown the amaranth from this section. I'm not growing amaranth this year. Previously when I did grow amaranth, I had serious issues with cucumber beetle and four line plant bug ruining the foliage of amaranth, which is not a huge problem since we're growing amaranth <laughs> for the heads. Um, but it did kind of cross my mind Am I bringing in those bugs that wouldn't normally be here? Are they acting as a trap crop for those bugs? Since I stopped growing amaranth, I don't have as much cucumber beetle. So that's the reason why I stopped growing amaranth altogether. Um, I'm not giving that as a recommendation or anything. I'm just saying that's my personal experience growing amaranth is that especially the cucumber beetles just decimate the leaves. Um, and also at the flower stand and at the, the kind of bouquet that I did, those really drapey tassels, they didn't work so well. And I would say they were unnecessary. It really didn't elevate the bouquet at all to have grown the amaranth, to have had the problems with the cucumber beetle and the four-aligned plant bug when I could just grow more celosia. So similar look, better for I think a hand tied mixed bouquet at a flower stand. I would always choose celosia over amaranth for a flower stand situation. And especially if you have those kind of bugs in your garden. So she's talking now about the perennial aster, but I thought I would touch briefly on the annual aster that a lot of people grow for cat flowers because I had serious issues with annual asters when I grew them, specifically with leaf hoppers. The first year, just some leaf hoppers. The second year, horrible, just absolutely horrible with the leaf hoppers on those asters, the annual asters. So um, once again, I just decided not to, not to grow them again. Chinese lantern, I've never been able to get my hands on the seed of Chinese lantern, and I am dying to grow that. But now what she was talking about is the perennial aster. Once again, I'm not really putting that in a bouquet because I feel like it has too much of a wildflower look. Sedum, I like to grow and I like to put in green before it turns, like this is Autumn Joy sedum here and it gets that nice maroon color, but I think it does look too common at this point. But if you put it in green as a textural filler, it looks a lot like an Orlea seed pod. It fills up, it adds bulk to the arrangement. I think it looks nice, sophisticated, and it just lasts forever and ever and ever. It's one of those things that you'll end up composting it yourself because you're tired of looking at it. Or you could just stick the cutting in the ground and then you can have a free sedum plant. So what are we going into now here? We're going into like pumpkins, sunflowers. So you guys know that I like to do a lot of sunflower successions. The last, I think, three years, I was doing them every two weeks. 
This year I'm doing them every three weeks because I'm going even heavier into lily production. But I feel like, you know, you just can't go wrong with sunflowers, especially specialty sunflowers. <laughs> Here goes Grace, I don't know what she's doing. Um, I'm growing Pro Cut Plum this year. I'm growing Sunflower Steve's Sunflowers. I'm growing Vincent and I'm growing uh, Pro Cut Gold Light. I grew that a couple years ago. I felt like the neck was weak, but I think it was my fault. I think I had spaced them too far apart. So I'm gonna make sure and do four, no more than six inches apart on that and see if that fixes the neck problem I was having but my personal favorite is Pro Cut Plum because I feel like it's a nice sophisticated color that works in the spring, summer, and fall. You just can't beat it. It's just, it's so beautiful. And for whatever reason, the bugs don't seem to bother Pro Cut Plum like they do the white sunflowers. And I've talked about that before. I don't grow white light or white night anymore because the bugs, and see now I can't even remember what bug it was. I think it was some kind of a worm was ruining the head of the sunflower, basically ruining the entire sunflower. Here's some hellebores. I'm still using hellebores in arrangements. In fact, um, if I can remember, I'll put a picture on the screen right now. I did ranunculus, martagon lilies, hellebores, um, bachelor's buttons, and three stems of Solomon seal. Hey, Grace. Only one of those bouquets sold, so I was able to keep the other one, and it's a week and a half old, and the only thing that is starting to fall apart are the bottom martagon lilies are losing their petals, but everything else looks fabulous, and the hellebore, because it's later on in the year, it has seed pod. It looks like I just cut it yesterday, so a week and a half later. So there's so many two perennials that are so great, you know? I think that's pretty much the end of the book, but I should probably do another video just about perennials because I feel like there are a lot of perennials that really can take the heat of the flower stand. I'm looking now at some sea holly. You can't beat sea holly. That stuff will just last forever in the heat. Um, so I think what I'll do is if you guys like this kind of video and you don't mind me just kind of talking off the top of my head and being kind of positive and negative about flowers, I'll maybe just walk through the garden, look at all the perennials and share which ones are good cut flowers and especially which ones are good cut flowers at the heat of a flower stand, right? A lot of people ask me about catmint. I wouldn't put catmint at the flower stand. Um, what would be a good substitute for that? Maybe clary sage would be something that would look somewhat similar to catmint and be okay in a bouquet. But once again, I really wanna to try to move away from anything that looks common and move more towards something that people feel like, oh, I wanna to go to that other flower stand that has the different flowers, the flowers that dried really well, the flowers that didn't stink up the water, the flowers that didn't turn the water a murky color. Um, some other things that I haven't mentioned are Macrophylla hydrangeas. The blue Macrophylla hydrangeas sell so well. And the main bush that I cut from was already here when we moved in. So, so many times too, there's things on your property already that are going to sell like hotcakes that, you know, my neighbors aren't selling blue Macrophylla hydrangeas. You get a great base life off of those. Um, what I do with the blue macrophylla hydrangeas if it's very hot is I only sell in the morning. So it's like, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 and I'll just make sure and advertise the day previous to that on Facebook that, hey, the hydrangeas are in, come and get them. They'll only be here for a couple days and that helps me push those flowers through. Well, friends, I hope you liked this video. Let me know if you didn't, that's totally okay too. But I do hope that if you're just getting started that more than anything, that this video will just serve as a nice reminder to take into consideration the climate that you're growing in, the pests and diseases that are prevalent in your area, who your customer is, who you want your customer to be, and where are you gonna sell the flowers and what are those flowers going to experience during the selling process? And think about all those things before you decide what to grow. That's what I wish I would have done early on. And I still have so much more to learn and I'm just excited for the journey. I love the journey, I love learning. 
I just want to learn as much as I can. I want to experience as much as I can with cut flowers because there's something really, really special about gardening, but cut flower gardening and selling cut flowers is incredibly rewarding because you really get that whole experience taking a seed, putting it into the earth, caring for it, cutting it, caring for it after it's been cut, and then showing someone else the value of that and have them pay you that value back. There's nothing else that I've ever experienced quite like it. Well, friends, I wanna wish you a wonderful day. Hopefully this video is not insanely long and I'll see you in a shorter video for sure sometime soon. Bye.